Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Mary Gannon. I'm here with Patrick Thomas, one of our administrative law judges. Thank you for your patience this morning, and thank you for signing in. And um, we'll try to get done within the hour still. Okay, and as you see on the first, you. on the first PowerPoint there, and I think that's even in the one that's posted, you see the arrow to where the chat is, which obviously most of you have already found it since you were already chatting with this, but that's where you go if you've got questions as well. Okay. This is the number of public sector bargaining units we have in the state now, uh, 1,134 bargaining units. And you see the numbers, the, the vast majority of them um, are in the education sector. And um, this includes, for education at least, it includes the classified employees as well as the certified employees. And um, then you have 255 county, 332 city, 22 state. The, that's the number of units we have in the state of Iowa for the public sector bargaining units. This is the potential number of elections we may have this fall. 272 K-12, again, that includes uh, the classified, uh, which is the support staff, and the certified, which is the teaching staff. But that also includes guidance counselors, media specialists, nurses, etc. cetera. Um, 127 city units, 111 county units, 15 community college units, and AEAs have 10 units for a total of 535. We know that number will go down, but we don't know by how far. But at this point, it's looking like it may be the biggest round of elections we'll have since the um, law went into effect back in 2017. As I think most of you know, this law was passed in um, 2017 and went into effect on uh, the 17th of February that year, where now we have to have retention and recertification elections. Employees, which are called eligible voters, in um, the bargaining units have to re recertify their unions um, at least within five years, but every um, year where their contract is up for, where their contract is up. So within 10 months of that point, um, the um, contract has to be recertified or it will go, it basically goes away. So. Um, you have to vote to keep it or you vote to decertify that. And if 50% or more of the eligible voters vote yes, then the union is retained. If less than that votes no or does not vote, then the union goes away at that point. Uh, the role of PERB is to conduct the election as required by the statute, ensure that it's a fair election process, and we have to provide an accurate tally of the results. Um, PERB has always been a neutral agency and will continue to do so throughout this process. So with that overview, the, the first question is, and as Mary mentioned, when are these, ele these elections uh, occur? The event that triggers a retention recertification election is the expiration of a, of a unit's collective bargaining agreement. Under Iowa Code, um, 20.15 uh, sub 2, it requires that the agency hold an election um, 8 to 10 months prior to the expiration date of the collective bargaining agreement. So this is a schedule of the election Okay, that's going to take place. Um, as I mentioned, for the for contracts that end, um, most of them will end on June 30th of 2020, but for school districts, if it's between June 30th and August 31st of 2020, the election will be conducted um, from October 15th through October 29th. That's going to be the voting period. This is a list of the major um, dates that you need to know um, to go through this election. This schedule is posted on our website. Um, it is in, under the recertification um, tab and it will provide all the major dates that you need to know. Um, for the units voting this fall, we have contracted with an election vendor, Yes Elections. They're an internationally recognized neutral election service corporation. Um, the elections will be conducted both online and by phone. Um, the user will go into more detail later in the presentation, but you will either go to our website, which will be www.iapervote.com, or call a toll-free number. You'll provide your voter credentials, which will be the date of birth, and the last four digits of the social security number, and you can log on or call in 
to cast a vote. Um, the, I assume, I assume um, some of you have undergone a retention recertification election um, at some point in the past couple of years. If you have, the process will be very similar to how we conducted it in the past couple of years, but there are a few changes to our rules that we want to um, point out. The biggest change we made um, when we updated our rules this spring is that we took the rules re uh, governing retention recertification elections and moved them um, from Chapter 5 into their own chapter, which is now Chapter 15. Um, oh, slow down. Yeah, our rules are now in Chapter 15. Um, we did this because the rules around retention and recertification elections, there's quite a few of them, and it's fairly detailed. And when it was in Chapter 5, it was kind of difficult for the parties to follow. So we think by moving them to their own chapter, they're much clearer and easier to follow. Um, in addition, there is now a requirement that both employers and certified employee organizations have a representative or an agent for service listed in their bargaining unit case file. Um, you can do this by going online and filing a notice of appearance without a document in the BU case file for each unit that you're representing. And that way, we can be sure that when we file a notice, um, electronically file a notice, that the parties are receiving it. Um, in addition, we raise the election fee from $1 to a $1.50 per eligible voter. We did this because our contract with our prior vendor ended last year, and we had to rebid for a new contract. Um, we went with the lowest bidder. Um, however, the cost did go up. So if a similar number of voters who voted in the past two elections vote in the next several elections, that cost will come out to about $1.50 per voter. And then finally, we clarified the deadline by which employers have to send in a collective bargaining agreement to the agency. They must have the, a copy of their collective bargaining agreement to the agency at least 50 days before the actual voting begins. Um, okay, I'm getting a question. We, um, who constitutes an eligible voter? Um, we will go into more detail in, in the presentation, but it will be anyone who is employed on the date that the order directing an election is filed. But we'll, we'll cover that as we go on. But here, um, the, we must have a copy of the collective bargaining agreement by August 26th of 2019 in order for an election to be scheduled. So those are kind of the major changes to be aware of. The question just popped up, do we need to send in another collective bargaining agreement if you already sent one in when it started? I'm not sure what you mean by that, but if you've had any collect, if, if it's a new collective bargaining, gar bargaining agreement, then yes. If it's um, a carryover and it didn't expire on June 30th of this year, then no. Okay, the election notification overview. All of our notices are filed through the PERB's electronic filing system. And uh, I will show you that later on when we get to the website. And they're all e-filed with um, to your bargaining unit's case file. Every single election will have a case file. And we'll show you what that looks like later on. Um, and the question just came in about our your agreement expires in 2021. So yes, you won't have an election this fall, but you will have one next fall. So um, you might um, you might just uh, pay attention for what will happen next year. Um, every employer unit and every employee unit will have to have um, a sign on into our system. So they get the notices as they come out. So the agent for service of the employee organization, because it, it's likely a Uniserv director, um, employee organization reps. Um, for the employer, it's likely the superintendent, the business manager, the city or county officer, HR directors, any of those people. Um, and then additional representatives can also be in there. Oftentimes it may be an attorney. Um, it could be... Um, anybody else so uh they just notice they file a notice of appearance without a document and that's in our e-filing system and we'll show you that later on i'm gonna say if to do this right okay 
posting and distribution of notices. Now, I'm going to focus on this for a second, and, and for the employer reps who are out there, this is not, these are not mere suggestions. These are duties that are actually laid out in the Iowa Code and laid out in our rules. These are the employer's responsibility. They have to be posted in, a, in the manner and location that are customarily used for posting. So if you have, um, many employers have a employee billboard or a union, not billboard, um, bulletin board, that's fine. Just go ahead and continue to use that. Or if the customary uh, distribution process is through employee email, do it that way. And I can tell you probably some of our number one complaints we get from um, employees is that they aren't getting the notices. They're not seeing them posted. Now, this could easily be an objection in the process. Um, so employers... It is vital that you get those posted. Uh, at a glance, the steps in the, re the certification election. Okay, PERB determines that an election must be conducted based upon the, the expiration date of your collective bargaining agreement. So if you have one expiring sometime this summer, those are the ones that will be happening this fall. The vast majority expired on June 30th, 20, um, 2019, but they often expire sometime over that period. Um, those will be the ones who have an election this fall. Um, PERB also then will file the notice of intent to conduct a recertification and a notice to employees. Those will be e-filed on August 26th. The um, employer must then file or post and distribute that information about the notice of the election. And they'll be getting an alert from us at that same time. This is what the e-file looks like that you will be getting. Um, this is what an e-file notice looks like. It shows that um, Amber DeSmet, who is one of our administrative law judges, sent that out and it shows who it went to. Uh, it went to the, well, it's about the Ballard School District. And then at the bottom, it shows who they were served. It's the superintendent um, from Ballard and Rick Moore, who is the Uniserve director for the Ballard School District. Those are who received the notifications. So those two both have filed, have been listed as the contacts for the Ballard School District. All right, so as Mary mentioned, the first notice that PERB will send out in this process is called the Notice of Intent to Conduct an Election. Um, this notice is, is basically PERB's way of saying to the parties that based on our internal uh, or based on our records, we believe that you are due to have a retention and recertification election this fall. If the parties, if, if one of the parties believes that this is not the case and that we have, we've incorrectly um, filed a notice of intent, you can file an objection in your BU case file. You'll electronically file an objection to the notice of intent. The agency will investigate and, and if necessary, you can hold a hearing to determine if an election should be held. Conversely, if we do not, and that date is by September 3rd. Um, conversely, if we do not file a notice of intent and a party believes that an election should be held, they must file a notice in their BU case file um, alerting, uh, alerting the agency and will investigate to determine whether an election um, should be held. Um, again, by September 3rd, 2019. Um, the objection form and the notice form were, uh, I believe they will be posted to the website. I don't think they're there yet, but we'll have those in the next couple weeks. So the information that the notice of intent provides, first the notice of intent informs the employees of PERB's intent to conduct the election. There's a notice to employees that the employer must post, and as Mary mentioned earlier, they must provide that notice to those employees by those other means. Um, second, it informs the employer that it must send in a list of employees in the bargaining unit to PERB by September 3rd. Um, it informs the employee organization that it must pay an election fee, which is based on that list of employees by September 16th. It will also provide a timeline of the election and it will also have a unit description so the parties know which job classifications are part of the bargaining unit. So after the notice of intent goes out, the 
the next step is for the employer to submit a list of employees in that bargaining unit to the agency by September 3rd. Um, the list, it, this is a, an important note, the list must be formatted in a specific way. The notice of intent will instruct how we would like that list formatted. We will also send out to the parties a, Excel, a sample Excel spreadsheet with it already formatted that the employer can just um, provide the employee information in so that we, like we, as Mary said, we might have 535 elections and we can't be working on the formatting here. So that list will require the employee's first and last name, their job classifications, their addresses, their known work and home uh, email addresses, their known work and home telephone numbers, the last four digits of their so social security number, and the employee's date of birth. And then we need it um, organized alphabetically by the employee's last name. Um, again, the notice of intent will explain how we want that formatted. Um, after they submit the list, they will sep the employee will separately email the employee organization to tell them that the list was submitted, the date that they submitted it, and the number of employees on the list. So the, uh, this year, the employer has two different options for how they would like to submit the list. Same, same as in past years, they can either directly email um, the list to PERB by sending it to iaperb at iowa.gov. Um, alternatively, if they would like to submit the list through a Centrix share file um, portal, they can do this by emailing the agency a request for a link to that portal by Friday, August 30th, um, close of business on Friday, August 30th. The agency will email them a link to a share file portal and the employer can upload the list through that link. Now I want to emphasize that requesting the link is not the same as submitting the list. So after the employer requests the link, they must submit the list to the agency by September 3rd. Um, the same deadline as if they would email it. One second, I got a question here. I want to see. Does the voter list include probationary employees? Um, yeah. yeah. Um, yes, it would include probationary employees. Um, anyone who is in the bargaining unit description. Um, but so what happens to the voter list once, the, once it's sent to PERB? First, we will save the list in a folder on a secure network drive. Um, we will then redact the dates of birth and the last four digits of the social security numbers off of the list, and we will email that list to the employee organization. So that list will only include the names, job classifications, and contact information. We then redact the list again and remove the contact information. So the list only includes the names and job classifications, and we will upload that list into the bargaining unit um, case file. That list is going, that is what um, will be the initial voter list, and the employees on that list um, determine the election fee that the employee organization must pay by September 16th. So this is the election fee schedule. As I mentioned, the, um, the number of employees on the list is what determines the election fee. So if there are 10 or fewer voters in the bargaining unit, the uh, election fee is just $15. If there are 10 or more, then the fee is $1.50 per eligible voter. When the employee, the employee organization will pay the election fee by check made payable to PERB and, and then include on the check the employee organization name, the employer's name, and the bargaining unit number on the check. If you are paying for multiple units with one check, which is fine, just be sure to attach a separate document that has the, the organization's name, the employer's name, the bargaining unit number, and the number of employees in the unit for each unit for which you're paying. So if the, um, the list is submitted and if the, um, uh, the election fee is paid by September 16th, the next step is that PERB on September 18th will file a direction of election which includes a notice of election. This will all be one document, and as I said, it will be filed on September 18th. The direction of election orders that a retention recertific recertification election be conducted. It will provide the dates of the election, which in this case will be a two-week period from 
8 o'clock a.m. on October 15th to 9 o'clock a.m. on October 29th, for which the employees can vote. And it will order the employer to send in a supplemental eligible voter list if um, employees have left the unit or new people have been hired or if there are just mistakes on the initial list. If the initial list is fine, you do not need to send in a supplemental list. And then the notice of election will need to be posted by the employer and it will contain information on who, how, and when the employees can vote. Okay, voting information. The bargaining unit description. The bargaining unit is actually what dictates um, who is an eligible elector. And so you have to go by the description that's in your contract or the description in your um, unit um, description that is actually on file here in our office. We will send that when we send out um, the first um, document we send to you. It'll actually tell you who's in your bargaining unit. Now, make sure you go over that in fine detail because we have discovered um, in the two years we've done this that a lot of people don't know who's in their bargaining unit and you may have people missing and um, you need to really figure out who's in that bargaining unit. That very first year I had a call from a superintendent and he said, uh, Mary, I was just reading the bargaining unit description that you sent us and apparently when we, edit, when we amended it a few years ago, we forgot to put teachers back in. And um, that was kind of a shock to them that they had everybody else in the unit description but teachers. And he said, I really think we need to have teachers um, voting this fall. And this is coming from a superintendent. And I said, yeah, I think that'd probably be a good plan. And so he said, what do we do? And I said, well, what you do is you get an agreement with the teachers unit um, and say that teachers should be voting this fall. So it's basically just an informal agreement between the employer and the employee to have the actual appropriate bargaining unit voting and then you go ahead and amend the unit after um, the election and so they went ahead and did that not long after the election. So what you can do is you, if it's not the right language that you think is the appropriate bargaining unit, you go ahead and have an informal um, d discussion and agree to what the bargaining unit should look like. If you can't come to that, come to an agreement the actual language of the bargaining unit that's the one on file here at PERB is the one that's going to dictate who gets to vote this fall. So make sure you check over the actual description of your unit. Okay, and Patrick talked about the election period starts October 15th at 8 a.m. and ends October 29th at 9 a.m. Um, voting by internet or by phone, and those of you um, who have had in the past voted by phone, it's going to be a much simpler, much more intuitive process than it has been in the past. It's going to be a simple yes, no. And that was one of the uh, probably stronger mandates we put in the RFP we sent out this year is that it's going to be yes, no. Um, voting instructions will be sent out when we're closer to the elections. Um, and we will have uh, basically screenshots of how the, um, the yes, no, how do the phone, in the phone process is going to work as well as the website process. It'll have the sample ballot questions and what they're going to look like as, like as well. This is what the ballot question is going to look like. Um, at least this is, well, this is what we're assuming. This is what we're telling them we want it to look like. Um, do you, and then it'll have the employee organization, so it could be, do you, City of West Des Moines Police, and police Unit, whatever. Uh, want to, do you want um, the City of West Des Moines Police Unit want to be retained and recertified and continue to be your exclusive bargaining representative? Yes, no. So if you're on the phone, it's say if you want, if you want yes, press one. If you want no, press two. And then it will ask you, are you sure you want to vote yes or are you sure you want to vote no? It will ask you to, to verify that before you go on. And it's the same thing as the online one. It'll ask you to verify your vote. So nice and simple. Um, if you have questions throughout the process, uh, if, you have exper if you have problems with the actual voting, assistant, voting system or you need assistance in voting, such as if you've got um, a disability and you want help voting, um, that's when you call the Yes Election and we will have the 800 number in all of our documents as well as on our website, you call them. But if you have 
general questions about the election process, you can call our office and our number is uh, on all of our materials as well or our email address is on there as well. Um, as Patrick has kind of hammered already, uh, who are the eligible voters? We talked about who they are in the sense of eligible because they're in the bar listed in the bargaining unit, but they have to have been employed on September 18th. Um, if they're not employed on September 18th, they should not be on the list. If they're um, employed on, 17, uh, on September 18th and they're not on the list, they should be added to the list. Okay. The employer uh, has a duty to amend the list within the seven days of that September 18th date, and that is September 25th. The process for sitting, submitting the amended list is no different than that initial list. And the employer, when um, he or she amends the list, has to notify the certified representative um, about the amendment to the list and what that amendment was. So as Mary was saying, um, these are the major dates and deadlines for the voter list. And from our experience, if there is Going, if an issue is going to arise during the election process, the conflict will probably be about the voter list. So it is very important to review these lists early to determine if they are accurate and if there is any issue with the list to communicate that uh, between the parties. Um, an eligible voter uh, is an employee in the bargaining unit who is employed on the date of the order directing an election, which is going to be September 18th. Um, however, the parties can come to a different agreement if they want to, uh, as Mary mentioned earlier, include some people or exclude some people. If the parties agree, that's, that's fine with us. But So again, September 3 is the date that the employer must send in that initial list. Then September 25 is the last day for the employer to update that list unilaterally. If there are mistakes or people have left the unit, September 25th is the last day for the employer to send us that supplemental list. At that point, we, I mean, we really need the parties to review this to make sure it's accurate, but on October 8th, it's the last day for the employee organization to propose additions or deletions to the list. Um, it's also the last day for the parties to mutually agree on a list. And if for some reason the parties just cannot agree on who should be an eligible voter, if there's a dispute about whether someone constitutes an eligible voter, October 8th is the last day for the parties to, um, to file what's known as a pre-election challenge. Um, the pre-election challenge, um, we'll have a form on our website. Um, again, we really want the parties to work together so we don't have too many of these or any of them. But you would file it in the BU case file, and that essentially would flag the issue. Then we would go ahead and conduct the election, and if that, if that disputed voter or voters may have affected the outcome of the election, then we would conduct a hearing to determine whether or not they were an eligible voter. But that October 8th is the last day to file that challenge. So when the, so the voter lists have come in, um, we've sent, hopefully they look great, we've sent that information on to the election vendor. The next step in the election process is the actual voting. As we've mentioned several times, the voting period will begin at 8 o'clock a.m. on October 15th, and it will conclude at 9 o'clock a.m. on October 29th. And I want to emphasize that 9 o'clock a.m., it, it will end. At that point, you have to have the ballot submitted. Even if you're in the website at that point, at 9 o'clock a.m., it shuts down. So be sure to have your ballot cast by 9 o'clock a.m. on October 29th. Um, the employees will be voting by phone or by internet. It'll be a similar process either way, but if, by, if online, you'll go to www.iapervote.com and you'll come to a page with two separate login boxes. In the first box, you'll, well, I'm not sure what order it'll be in, but in one of the boxes, you will type in your date of birth, and in the second box, you'll type in the last four digits of your social security number. Um, at which point you will go to a, have some sort of, we anticipate like a welcome page saying you've received, you're now voting in the Iowa 2000, 2019 retention recertification elections. You'll follow the instructions and you will go to a ballot that, as Mary mentioned earlier, will say 
do you want your employee organization to be retained and recertified as your collective bargaining um, or exclusive bargaining representative? And you will choose either yes or no. And then we don't know exactly what it'll look like, but some sort of submit button. You will then have another page that says you have chosen either yes or you've chosen no. Um, is this how you want to cast your vote? And you will click confirm. And then you will have a page that says thank you. So it is very important that you you click the confirm button after you choose your option, otherwise your ballot won't have been submitted. So that's what that will look like and we'll have more information in the coming months as to exactly what those systems will look like. Um, so throughout the, um, the uh, election period, um, PERB will provide progress reports so that the parties know how many individuals in their bargaining units have voted. Um, PERB cannot disclose who has voted or how anyone has voted. That's all confidential. But we can let you know how many have voted so that you can kind of keep track of that throughout the period. On October, at 9 o'clock a.m. on October 29th, the election period will come to an end. So we will begin tabulating the votes. Um, we will have our conference room open to the public and have a projector. Um, the actual tabulation will be done in private in one of the offices, but periodically we will bring the results out, put them on an Excel spreadsheet so if people want to attend and watch the results, they, they can. Um, we will then file the tally of results. On, they'll be unofficial, but they'll be filed on our website um, or uploaded on our website. Then there'll be a 10-day objection period, um, which we'll go into in a little more detail in, in just a minute. Um, and after 10 days, we will file the appropriate order, um, depending on the results of the election. So as Mary mentioned earlier, um, it's if a majority of the employees voted yes, then an order of recertification will be issued. And that means that the certified representative will continue to represent the employees in that unit. However, if a majority of the employees did not vote yes, then an order of decertification will be issued. That means the representative can no longer represent the unit. And there is also a two-year bar from the date that the tally is filed in which no other um, employee organization can represent that unit. They cannot file a petition to be the representative for that unit for two years. So as we mentioned before, there is a 10-day um, objection period. There are two different types of objections. There's a post-election challenge and an objection to the conduct during the election. I'll talk about each of those, but um, the first type is objectionable conduct during a campaign. Either party can object to the conduct of an election within 10 days of fi the filing of the tally. Um, and PERB can invalidate an election if objectionable activity took place during the election and it could have affected the results of the election. So what could invalidate an election? Um, one example is a misuse of PERB's documents, including an indication that PERB endorses any particular choice on the ballot. Um, it's possible that there could be misstatements of material facts by a party um, to the election or its representative with that, and there wasn't sufficient time for the adversely affected party to adequately respond. And then the commission of a prohibited practice during the election period um, could um, invalidate the election. Um, this would be some examples like uh, the employer cannot give a campaign speech to an assembled group of employees during working hours during the election period. Um, the employer cannot take a poll of the employees relating to the employees' preference for or against a uh, bargaining representative. And then just really any other misconduct or circumstances which prevents employees from freely expressing their preferences in the election um, could potentially be grounds to invalidate the election. Um, as I mentioned before, there is a second type of challenge that you can file in that 10-day period. It is called a post-election challenge. And these are pretty specific. This is only challenging the total number of, bar of employees in the bargaining unit. And this would result from an employee who was employed on, the, on September 18th when the order directing election was filed, but left the unit before the end of the voting period on October 29th. So in the case where an eligible voter has left the unit, if 
if you can't if we can't resolve the dispute and it is determinative of the outcome of an election the board will hold a hearing and if the challenge is upheld the board may either adjust the tally or may order a new election um, so those are uh, only if an eligible voter has left the unit before the end of the election period the on our website which I will go to here in a minute um, the general information about the recertification elections is actually on our website we have a recertifications tab um, not a whole lot's there yet for this year because we really haven't started everything yet but there is information there as we said earlier each bargaining unit will have a case file I showed you the Ballard one a few minutes ago the beginning of one and um, bar bargaining unit descriptions can be found on the website under the units tab what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to go out of the PowerPoint and go into our website which is right here so as you see at the top of our web page here you've got the list of units you've got the recertifications tab and it has for 2019 so far this year uh, we had March elections already but here's the fee schedule that Patrick talked about that shows you how to do this the fees and then you've got the calendar that he showed you as well um, and then there's a second page to this which we didn't go through that gives a lot more detail about what those dates mean then if you want to look at your bargaining unit descriptions since we've been using Ballard this morning we'll go to Ballard now this um, the first page was the order of recertification um, for which is their who they're, who's in their bargaining unit and this was just done as you see in November of 2018 because they had their election in the fall of 2017 when it didn't have the teachers in it but now it says regular full-time certificated teachers and regular part-time teachers guidance counselors librarians and nurses and as I told you when I had the conversation with the superintendent they only had the guidance counselors librarians and nurses so they went in and redid that um, and then it shows you who's excluded so this is where you go is under the units tab up here and then you determine obviously you know which one of these six you fall under and then go and just do a search on your name um, and pull up your own unit description so you know who's in your um, unit and I'm going to clarify when we were asked the question about um, probationary employees and I was I immediately went to teachers because teachers are on probation for the first three years of teaching um, the question and I guess there could be people in other units who might be probationary and that they may be excluded from a unit so the question is if with teachers it's not going to be an issue because they're going to be in the unit but there may be probationary people excluded from a unit so go, go by unless you're in the teaching world go by your own contract and make sure the probationary people aren't excluded from the unit okay um, so the next issue I'm going to show you the e-filing system we have and I'm using Stephanie's login hope she doesn't mind but it was already preloaded in here okay so here's the um, I typed in bargaining unit dash zero zero six one and here are the um, all of the filings from um, the 2017 election and the uh, 2018 election so here's the notice to employees that went out so here's the notice that was what that looks like and then um, direction of election and see there's you, where you get the description of the unit is right in your direction of election um, here's the tally of ballots that you will get at the end See, it's written in hand by hand there and it shows that the majority of the employees voted to retain and then uh, one other thing I want to show you here is hopefully it's up here 
This, if you go to show and hide participants, this will show you who the people are, who are um, the people who are authorized, who are the ones getting uh, the mailing. So it's Danielle Hainfield, who's the attorney for Ballard, um, Herman Maxey, who's really Adi Maxey, um, Adi, who's the superintendent, and Rick Moore, who's the Uniserve director for Ballard. So that's what your files will look like when you're in here. So that shows you how to get into those. So with that, I think we'll go back to GoToMeeting and um, start answering questions. Um, do they need to recertify every year only when the contract is up? It's only when the contract, the year in which the contract expires. And it's between, it's 10, no more than 10 months, approximately 10, it's 10, it triggers the 10 months before the contract expires. So if you expire, which the vast majority 